Well, I hope, I hope you'll help me a little bit as we start tonight. Knock, knock. Who's there? That's good. Ahashawaris. Ahashawaris who? Gesundheit. Ah, nice. Good. That's a good one, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tonight begins a Jewish holiday that most of us have probably not heard of or thought much about. Shushan Purim Katan. Anybody? Okay, good. You probably recognize the name of the holiday Purim, right? Purim, which we celebrate each year on the 14th of the month of Adar. While Shushan Purim takes place on the next day, the 15th of Adar, but generally not in our community. It takes place only in walled, city, walled cities. What was a walled city? Shushan. What's a walled city today? Jerusalem. Very good. So then, on a leap year, like the one that we are in, 5,784, we have two months of Adar. Adar 1 and Adar 2. So on the 15th of Adar 1, which we begin tonight, we have the holiday of Shushan Purim Katan, the little Shushan Purim. And so there's things that you might do on Shushan Purim, like celebrate Purim, that you do to a lesser extent on Shushan Purim Katan, because it's the small version, right? It's like the Prius versus the Tesla. Doesn't go quite as fast, okay? Great. Well, I love the holiday of Purim, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about it tonight, because it's coming up. I love Purim mostly because it involves costumes, and who doesn't love a good superhero dress-up from time to time? But I truly love Purim because it is the dedicated time to purposely be happy and laugh. You have to do it. And this is a balm for our weary souls that desperately needs such a thing to face the world that we live in today, a world we know is so very troubled. I remember back to when I was a child in the halls here at the temple, and the Purim carnival would take place on a Sunday morning, usually near Purim, and my job in the youth group was to pop the popcorn. And I remember that Alice Licker, the religious school director at the time, would tell me, you can't start popping the popcorn too early because everyone will want to come out of the sanctuary because they'll smell the popcorn, and we can't start the Purim Carnival until after we've heard the Megillah be read, usually with Cantor and Rabbi dressed up on the bima, all sorts of fun. So I remember those moments, and I would always start the popcorn just a little bit too early because I like to eat the popcorn, too. It's not widely known, but ancient Persia was where Eastern mysticism began. And it's thought that Mordechai was the person responsible for bringing these beliefs into Jewish mainstream. After Mordechai learned of the plot against King Ahasuerus and fingered out and singled out the would-be assassins, he became very afraid for the safety of Queen Esther. So he began praying for her, fasting five days a week, going barefoot, and wearing sackcloth and ashes. When he did eat, he only ate grains and certain vegetables. Since Shusa, or Shushan, was located in the foothills of the mountains of Persia, the ground was very rocky, and so Mordechai developed an impressive set of calluses on his feet. His constant fasting soon made him quite frail, and with his odd diet, he suffered from terrible breath, so Mordechai had become a super calloused, fragile mystic, <laughs> hexed by halitosis. There you go. The story of Purim. Okay. Enough bad puns, I promise. The theme for this season of Adar, the month where we celebrate Purim, is Misha Nichnas Adar Marbim Basimcha. From the opening of Adar, we increase in joy each time, each day. This phrase is a directive that comes out of the Talmud, tractate Ta'anit, and it reflects Mordechai's announcement at the end of the book of Esther, 
that the month of Adar, the month in which the Jews of Persia overcame their enemies, would be a month turned from sorrow into joy. The trajectory from heartache to delight is a pretty familiar framing in Jewish holidays. At Hanukkah, we light an additional candle every night, Marbim Bakodesh, increasing our sense of holiness each day. And an appropriate way to celebrate the temple's rededication after its destruction. At Passover, we celebrate the journey upward too, trying to feel what it was to be enslaved, sometimes even dancing around our tables, singing Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves, and then rising up to burst out into freedom, Atabane Chorin. Now we are a free people, an effort to recognize the miracle of redemption. And at Sukkot and Simchat Torah, we celebrate Zman Simchatenu, a time of our ongoing rejoicing for bountiful harvest and shelter. The merriment we're supposed to have on Purim feels characteristically different, though, from these other celebrations. First, Purim's joy should be extreme, Ad lo yada, which means party until you can no longer differentiate between good or evil. That feels a little scary, perhaps. And second, it celebrates overcoming something that leaves a deep knot in our guts, because tragically, we know that Haman's plot is too real in our world for Jews and also for other groups. An attempt to do away with an entire people has happened too many times. But I'm not looking to put a damper on the exuberance that we should create for Purim. To the contrary, I wish to propose that the opportunity for unbridled joy on Purim is a powerful and perhaps even therapeutic tool for us in our daily struggle against hatred of all kinds. How so? First, Purim through its satire, is actually brutally honest. It's a story blunt, its story bluntly illustrates the exact flaws we know to be true about our world. That there exist in every generation many rulers who are far more concerned with their own image and the preservation of their reign than they are with the welfare of the citizens in their care. Just like in the royal courts of Shushan, sexism abounds that governments are often fraught with barriers and hurdles that create divisions rather than unity, that aspiring political leaders clamor for power over others by trying to control people's bodies and their freedom, and that evil, even when under disguise, is real, seemingly in every age a hateful villain intent on inflicting violence rises up against the Jews or another group. But in order to exist and persevere, we need the sustenance of joy in our lives. Purim helps us find joy when we would otherwise conclude all is lost, the world is gone. Purim becomes a practice, an exercise, an exercise of lifting up and finding joy of simcha as a value in our lives. Whether it's the obvious simcha of a life cycle celebration Sometimes even we're so busy that we breeze through those, getting to the wedding at the last moment, or running over to drop off a meal but not staying after the baby was born. We're so busy, we're so consumed. Or the more easily overlooked simchas that we feel, from a simple moment holding a child's hand on the way into school, or a quiet afternoon sitting and reading our favorite book in the sun, or the relief that comes from a moment of profound healing or a resolve for peace after a war. Tasting an abundance of joy on Purim helps us better identify the small moments of joy and lift them up each day. In the words of Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav, finding true joy is the hardest of all spiritual tasks. If the only way to make yourself happy is by doing something silly, then do it. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs argues the existence of Purim in Jewish historical memory is in itself traumatic. But through its presence in our story, 
we're better equipped to confront the hatred and large-scale trauma that we might encounter. Sometimes as rabbis and Jewish educators and cantors, we wonder, should we tell the end of the Esther story when the Jews of Persia lash out and destroy others? Should we tell the gory details of our tradition stories? It's traumatic. Jewish tradition suggests that we practice the holiday of Purim in ways that bring us face to face with other people. These actions breed resiliency. There are four traditional mitzvot on Purim. One, mishloach manot, giving gifts of food and treats to our friends. This action spreads joys to others by bringing us closer to our friends. Matanot la'evyonim, number two, sending gifts of food and treats to our friends, excuse me, gifts and food to the poor and needy through acts of tzedakah. We reinforce our commitment to bettering the world on Purim, and we become more aware of the freedoms and privileges that we actually have and that we take for granted. Third, the Seudat Purim, a festive meal with the community bringing people together. And lastly, Megillat Esther, the reading, the hearing of the book of Esther, the public hearing of the book, something else which must take place together. This particular commandment, I believe, holds powerful lessons for equipping ourselves to face future traumatic potentials. Through it, we learn that it takes just two people to defeat Haman when we hear that story. Esther, with her honesty, her political prowess, her talent for effective communication, and Mordechai, with his perseverance and firm commitment to his values. He only will bow to one God, no matter what. Through these individuals and their teachings of strongly held beliefs and honesty, the Jews of Persia are saved. Biblical scholar Adele Berlin astutely points out that the genius of the book of Esther isn't just in the characters themselves, but in the larger use of comedy in its genre. Berlin writes, the book of Esther is the most humorous book of the Bible, but its inclusion in the biblical canon serves to suppress its most plausible and powerful reading. Purim is a powerful tool because it offers therapeutic laughter when we need it most. The book of Esther is at its core a farce, with sections poking fun at the Persian court that fall into the category of burlesque. The evil of Haman is disarmed by much humor as it is by anything else. For example, in chapter 6, King Ahasuerus asks Haman to describe how the man whom the king desires to honor should be celebrated. Haman, how should we celebrate you? Haman responds, assuming he would be the chosen one. He suggests that the honoree should be paraded through the city on a horse, wearing royal garb and the, carrying the royal diadem. Ahasuerus then commands to Haman, Great, then go get the garb, go get the horse, and put Mordechai out there, that old Jew who sits at the gate. Omit nothing you've proposed. It's humorous. Knock, knock. Vashti. Wash the dishes and I'll give you a hamantashen. <laughs> Especially in a world that we know is too often torn by violence and pain, it's important to still be able to laugh. Rabbi Sachs, in writing about Purim, shares a story of a Shoah survivor whose strategy for making, making his way through the terrible life in Auschwitz hinged on a pact that he made with a fellow inmate to look out each day for some occurrence that they found amusing. And at the end of that day, tell one another this story and make sure to laugh together. That sense of humor saved my life, he said. Laughter such as this, the laughter that we can find in the joy of Purim, the laughter that we can find in the little missteps that take place in a day, the laughter we can find at the bedside of a dying loved one when we recall a moment of their life that they would laugh at too. Laughter such as this helps us make the world whole. 
affords us a chance to sample just for a second what it might like be in the world to come. Practices of laughter therapies, even laughter yoga, have shown that our body's physiological responses can't distinguish the difference between planned laughter and spontaneous laughter. It sounds silly, but to laugh makes you laugh. The uplift we feel, the endorphin release, is the same. When we laugh, we gain strength, we build wholeness. When we laugh, we're usually in the presence of others. And through moments of joy, of laughter, of community, we become better able to take the small but powerful steps to make the brave and honest choices, even when it's difficult, like Esther and Mordechai did, that allow goodness to triumph over evil. And we also give ourselves an emotional strength to stand by our brothers and sisters of all faiths, those who appear different to us, in their times of mourning and sorrow, just as they do for us. In this month of Adar, pause the news feed for just a moment. Allow yourself to laugh, even while we confront that hatred abounds. Tomorrow we mark two years of the conflict in Ukraine. How could it have gone that long? Come this month and hear the story that confronts evil with unbridled joy and humor, and be with the community in a way that allows us to envision the world to come. Together on Purim, we'll confirm the belief that the power at work in the universe favors life and favors peace. Amen.